introduce Emily Zobel. And if you've been on any of these previous calls, you probably know Emily. Um, she's the ag agent in Dorchester County. Um, so over here on the Lower Eastern Shore. And um, she has a background in entomology. And um, I think you are the perfect person to present this talk. Awesome. Thank you so much. So thank you guys all for joining us for the very last one in the series. I hope you guys have attended some other ones and have enjoyed them and will fill out the surveys and give us some feedback. I think we definitely plan to, if not do another one of these this year, definitely do them again next spring. And for those of you who this is your first interaction with Extension, please keep checking our website, check our Facebook for other interesting gardening talks coming up because we will definitely have some. Um, and while we're gonna probably at some point get back in person, I think we will also continue to do some virtual ones as well. Let me go ahead and get my screen sharing. So hopefully you can just see the PowerPoint, right? Yep. And my notes, awesome. Okay, mm -hmm. so I'm gonna do a few quick disclaimers, which is our extension website is currently being updated to a new platform. So a lot of the links that I had in this in the morning didn't work because they were the old website. And then I started swapping them out for the new website, but the new website is currently crashing because it is still being uploaded. So I would ask that you guys give it a week or so before you go visit the extension website for information. Um, but once our new website is up and running, it should be really good. So what I'm going to mainly focus on for this topic talk isn't so much individual pest insects as much as a general idea on how you can go about managing pests in your yards, in your gardens, in your homes. And then I'll, I'll touch at the end about some kind of seasonal ones as well. Um, but everyone who's seen one of my talks knows that I sort of like to start off with resources and some great resources that we have that will work for stuff like this would be the University of Maryland Extension Home and Garden Information Center. Right now, again, the website is down, but luckily the blog is not. So if you do have an interesting issue or a question, you can always go to the blog and search via topic in the archives. And chances are there's probably an article someplace about it, if not, you can check other extension websites. So Clemson has another really good home and garden information one. Um, you can check places like the Missouri Botanical Garden or the National Garden Association has a learning library that has lots of really neat PDFs. Um, your local library also will have great books about gardening and any book that's about five to 10 years old should be up to date and relevant enough to kind of help you problem solve with anything that's happening in your garden or with basic information about like, how do I start gardening? How far do I plant tomatoes? What do I do now? What do I do now? So these are all some great resources. You also can reach out to your local extension agent, as well as once the University of Maryland Home and Garden Information Center's website is up and running, there is a part where you can email in questions that you have. So with that all out of the way, we're going to kind of dive into pest management, which is going to be, again, the focal of this. And I always like to start by talking about what exactly do we mean by a pest when I say pest management? So a pest is any living organism that causes significant economical or aesthetic damage to a plant. This can include things like insects, weeds, mites, nematodes, bacteria, fungi, and then even little vertebrates. So you might love this little bunny hopping in your front yard, but as soon as he turns around and starts eating your vegetable garden, he suddenly becomes a pest. Um, and this can be sort of a little weird because what one person feels like is a pest may not be a pest for another person. I know um, I had two ladies take master gardener basic training a few years ago when they were best friends and one needed to have a pristine front yard. If there was a dandelion in her yard, she was out there digging it up because she didn't want any weeds in her yard. The other one wanted an entire front yard covered in dandelions because she thought the yellow flowers were super pretty and they provided food for bees and she was just, she wanted them all. Um, so for one of them, they were a pest and for the other one, they weren't. 
So kind of as you think about pests in your own yard and other people's property, you can kind of think of it this way. Like, can I live with, you know, a dandelion in my yard, but maybe I draw the line when I have like 10. So think about your own comfort zone when we talk about this. So I'm gonna mainly focus on this technique that we call integrated pest management or IPM. This is sort of a very complex thing that's also very straightforward. You probably use this and don't even realize it, but from a scientific standpoint, this is the knowledge-based decision-making process in which the selection, integration, and implementation of pest management control tactics and management strategies are based on predicted economical, ecological, and social consequences. So to kind of make this a little bit easier, um, I've highlighted and marked different bits to kind of focus on. So this is first and foremost knowledge-based. So it's a little bit more scientific. You've done some research on it. You're not gonna just go out there and you know, dance around it and ring a tambourine and you know, th there's some science behind it. You're gonna use a combination of both control and management strategies. So that's both preemptive and proactive techniques. And when you're doing these techniques to kind of manage these pests, you're gonna balance out the economical or financial value along with their environmental damage or ecological as well as their social. So I know most of you guys have probably heard the whole, you know, don't put a $40 tree in a $4 hole. It's kind of the same thing. So if you end up spending tons of money to save a $4 tomato plant, instead of just pulling it out and going and buying a new tomato plant, like you've sort of wasted your time and energy and money and probably done more damage mentally and environmentally than just replacing kind of one troubled plant. Now, if it's a plant that has an emotional attachment, like a tree, then it might be worth more time and energy to try to prevent pest issues or save it if it gets a pest issue. So think about this all with regards to itself. Um, if you're still a little confused about how this works, think of it as in terms of things that you already know. So it's a toolbox. You have a lot of different tools here. You can pull them out and use them. The tool that you use today may not be the same tool as tomorrow because you might be building something different. If I'm putting together a shelf, I'm gonna use different tools than if I'm trying to fix a plumbing issue. You can also think of this as though it's a medical issue. So we go see doctors on a yearly basis to get our physicals. Maybe we have blood work done. Maybe they listen to our heartbeat. Maybe they sort of give us some recommendations on ways to get stay healthy all with the idea of preventing us from needing long-term dramatic care. So if a doctor can find an issue when it's still small and treat it, you may not need to spend a week in the hospital getting surgery or be on heavy duty medication because you've managed it through other tactics. So we wanna take these same principles and just apply them to our landscapes. So I'm gonna briefly go over kind of the steps of IPM. Um, and you'll see them listed there, but I really want you guys to think of IPM as circular and not linear because you're constantly doing all of these steps either at the same time in different places in your garden or simultaneously, or as soon as you finish the cycle, it starts again. So the first big step here is to know your garden. Um, and if you or someone like I just moved into my house three or four years ago, and I'm still learning things about my garden, I'm still learning what the soil's like and what grows where and how well it grows and all of that. So just knowing that kind of stuff can really help. You know, you don't want to put a plant that likes full sun in a shady area, nor do you want a plant that can't tolerate wet roots in kind of a low area. So fitting these plants to your garden environment is key. So we always recommend getting a soil test before you put in any major gardens or plants and taking into consideration any climate variables you have. So the climate here on the Eastern shore is a lot different than what you know, Western Maryland and the mountains would have. Um, so take those kinds of things into consideration. You also wanna know the plants themselves. So I think tomatoes are a great example here. If tomatoes have some odd growing habits. So you have to sucker them because if not, they get very bushy instead of keeping linear and then you cut down on the fruit you get. They also, by midsummer, start to brown at the bottom. Every time I have new gardeners at the community garden, they always start freaking out around end of July 
because their tomato plants start to look a little bit brown at the bottom. And that's just because that's where the old leaves are. And the plant's not putting energy into them. It's putting energy into the new leaves. So there's sort of this get to know like what's going to happen to your plants over the entire growing season. Come to terms with the fact that there are going to be some damage on your plants and that's okay. Um, just like when we get our hair cut and it kind of helps our hair grow longer, a little bit of munching by a bug or a few speckles dots from a fungus disease isn't gonna kill these plants and it's a-okay. Likewise, there's pretty much a limited number of diseases and pests that are commonly gonna be associated with each one of these plants. And if you know them ahead of time, it's easier to kind of see and know what they are, as well as to know when you need to do proactive things. So for the most part, a lot of our pest control can be after the fact when they appeared, with the exception of diseases, sometimes need to be done proactive. So you can kind of anticipate when they're gonna come and take steps to prevent them before it happens. So along with that, you do wanna prevent as many of those problems as possible. So again, healthy plants have fewer problems. So again, relate this back to us. Healthy people, so eat healthy, exercise, um, you socialize with people, you're, you know, you're healthy, you're engaging in a meaningful life, you're getting eight hours of sleep, tend to have less physical issues at least um, and can bounce back. So it's the same thing with your garden. You want to make sure that those plants are getting plenty of water, they're getting the nutrients they need, they're in the right climate, they're getting the right temperature, they've got the right sunlight issues and all of that. So really think about when you're putting plants in the ground, particularly perennials, so things that are going to be in the ground for a long period of time, that they are in the ideal habitat. Because trying to dig up a massive tree is not going to happen. Um, or if it is, it's going to be really expensive. And bushes are not the easiest thing to move either. Um, same thing with raised beds. If you put in raised beds, trying to move them a foot over because you realize that they're getting shade now instead of full sun can, can be a little bit of a struggle. It's not impossible, but you know, take that time to kind of figure out where the right location is for them. Then you always wanna monitor for problems. And I think most of us being gardeners are out in our garden probably weekly, if not daily. Um, and you just want to check plants. So just walk by your plants, acknowledge like, okay, how are they looking? Are they looking nice and green today? Do they look a little droopy? Um, you know, is there anything weird happening on them? Like, are they getting taller? Do they have fruit yet? Are the flowers blooming? Like, you know, flip over some leaves, check and see, do you have any bugs on them? You know, are you seeing bees on the flowers? Are there butterflies there? Just go out and enjoy your garden, but kind of make some little scientific inquiries as you do. Most plants are gonna have a delayed response with regards to damage. Um, it takes them a little bit of time to make enough dramatic changes for us to notice. But the flip side is that is that very few things are gonna kill a plant overnight. So normally you're gonna have some sort of damage done. Your plant's gonna respond to it over you know, a week to several weeks period, and then you may or may not pick up on it. So by monitoring it, you tend to observe that stuff earlier. Along with this, I would also say monitoring your own weather can be really helpful. So we've got these great examples of these pepper plants here that are super wilted. And it's possible that they got watered yesterday and it's just been so hot that they've already wilted. Or it's possible that it was super hot yesterday and the homeowner just didn't happen to check on them and they're wilted. And a day of being wilted isn't going to kill them. A whole week of being wilted may. So along with knowing and monitoring for these, if you know that pest life cycle, you know when to monitor for those pests. So Japanese beetle is a really good example here in that they start coming out as adults in midsummer. So you know to start monitoring for them and start establishing some control tactics for them mid-July through August. And as you're monitoring, if you come across the pest, you also wanna check for beneficial insects. So we can see there's all these little aphids. They're the little green bugs. You can see them here. They're also the green bugs here. But we also notice that we have a ladybird leaf larvae here. And these are spider mite destroyers, which is another type of um, beetle larvae. And these things love to eat aphids. So the, the fact that you have several around these aphids and this one here probably means that you don't really need to treat for these aphids or 
This is a great example of when you can make a note and come back and check it a few days later to see, do I need to treat for these aphids or not? So once you see an issue in your garden, the next thing you want to do is diagnose it. And you want to try to be as accurate as possible. Um, this is easier said than done. I know that I'm still learning things with regards to plants that are in my own garden. And I went to graduate school for this. So don't get frustrated if you need help with this. Um, and again, our Ask the Extension place on our Home and Garden Information Center is great for this. You can fill out a little form and submit three pictures of any plant issues or garden issues or weird bugs that you find. And it gets sent to a database that gets distributed across all of extension and people will answer your questions within a few days and give you some solutions to hopefully help you along the way. So it's a really good resource that you guys have. But when it comes to diagnosing, the first thing that you kind of want to do is define the problem. So what is the actual issue? And then from there, you're going to gather some information. So we can use this picture here as a great example. So here's a plant I have, and it's got these black splotches all over it. And they're kind of fuzzy and texturally there. So I would say it's a fungal disease. Um, and I could flip over the leaves. I could look at it. I could say, well, there's this black stuff, but there's also this like clear sticky liquid with it. Um, and then from there, I might flip over some of these leaves and say, hey, there are these aphids here as well. I wonder if these aphids are causing this. And from there, you can do some research and figure out that yes, in fact, this is sooty mold caused by honeydew, which is pooped out by aphids. So if I wanted to treat this, I would actually need to treat the aphids and not the sooty mold. But the flip side of that is a lot of times that insects get considered guilt by association. So take a step back and really figure out whether or not what you think is it, is it. Um, we want to remind people that 50% of their plant problems are actually caused by non-living things as well. So this would be um, temperature issues, weather issues, compactions one. I once had a lady call me and talk about how her tree was dying and she was positive that it was the caterpillars feeding on it, only to find out her husband hit it with the back of his pickup truck six months earlier and the tree basically lost half of its bark on the one side but she didn't think that was relevant because it had bark on the other side and it took six months for the tree to really show the signs of getting hit so you know always take a step back and kind of think about what's happened through the time period as well so just to quickly kind of touch on that a little bit more so some non-living factors again are going to be things like weather damage so this can be storm damage, this can be lightning, this can be hail, um, excessive rain, so temperature extremes, so really cold nights, really hot days, a whole week of really hot days, moisture extremes, too much water, not enough water, standing water, uh, nutrient disorders are when plants can't acquire the nutrients they need. This can be caused because of soil pH, this can be due to things like the moisture extreme. So if plants don't have water, they can't take up nutrients. So it goes hand in hand. Likewise, if plants are sitting in water and they're so full of water, they can't take up any more water. So then they can't take up nutrients. So plants are, are kind of really fickle. They're kind of weird organisms. They're a lot pickier than you think for something that doesn't move. Salt can be another one, um, particularly for those of us who live on the Eastern shore, salt is always something that kind of pertains. And then you can potentially have pesticide burn, which is what you're seeing here in this picture all along these bushes. And anytime you see anything in a straight line, it's pretty much a general idea that that is something man-made. Um, nature, nature's not straight. Nature doesn't do anything in a straight line. So if it's something like uh, a a yellowing mark in, a, in your turf grass and it appears to be in kind of a linear fashion, it's probably an issue with fertilizer or something like that. Most of these factors are gonna be in a larger areas. So this isn't gonna be like one random plant in your back corner. This is gonna be like a whole strip of your turf grass. Uh, or in this case, this isn't just one plant, it's a whole thing. You can see there's a pattern to it in that like it's damaged on one side, but not the other. If this was a disease issue, it would probably be damaged evenly throughout the whole plant. And it's generally going to take place over several species of plants. 
Because again, this isn't one thing that's as specialized as a disease. It's an environmental thing. You know, a hailstorm isn't going to only hit one plant in your yard. It's going to affect every plant in that yard. So when we compare this to living factors, which would be things like our pathogens and diseases, so viruses, bacteria, fungi, and nematodes, um, things like insects and mites, and then other animals would be things like rabbits or deers or um, birds and stuff like that. These guys tend to be more specialized. So you're not gonna find the same insect feeding on every plant in your garden. It has its favorites. It's gonna feed on you know, only your tomato plants or your tomatoes and other solanaceous. So tomatoes, peppers, and eggplants, but it's probably not also gonna feed on like an oak tree or your rose bush. Likewise, your diseases tend to be a little bit specialized as well. Most of your diseases, so your viruses, your bacteria, and your fungi are going to be, again, in the same plant family, if not an individual plant itself kind of deal. So look for those kinds of things. Is this affecting everything in this whole garden? Is it affecting the back corner? Is it affecting the rose bushes that I have both in the front and the backyard? When it comes to living factors, rather than having a symptom of your plant not feeling well, like drooping or something, you're going to normally see either the pest itself, in the case of this corn earworm, or in this fungal blot, or the rust on these leaves, but you might also see something like their damage. So in this case, this is Japanese feeding damage on roses. Um, likewise, if you couldn't see the corn earworm, if you opened up a husk of corn and found, you know, poop and in feeding, you would know, okay, there was a corn earworm here. So once you've kind of figured out either what you have or even what you don't have and can kind of like narrow it down, you need to decide if you need to take an action. And the decision that what you're dealing with isn't actually harmful is also a perfectly fine action to not take. So we would want you guys to realize that um, you need to accept some damage. You're never going to get kind of the pristine zero pest. That's unreasonable and honestly was mentally and environmentally probably not healthy to expect. And I know that there are people that are like that. Um, I dated someone for a while who was obsessed with having the greenest lawn on the block and we disagreed a lot on it, which is probably why we're not together anymore. But, you know, as, figure out what your aesthetic threshold is and be kind of comfortable with the fact that if you want everything to be perfect, you're going to have to spend a lot of time, money, and energy maintaining that. Um, I like to tell people to step back three feet and then look at it and see if you still think the damage is, is necessary. So in a garden like this, yeah, you might have some bugs feeding on this plant, or there might be a little bit of fungal disease on this, but if I'm standing way back here, it, it all looks good to me. It all looks beautiful. And I don't need to micromanage about all that. Um, Time-wise, how long is it going to be an issue? So right now I know most of us have all these little spring weeds up like dead, dead needle, but at the end of the day, they're going to be gone in another week or two because your turf grass is going to come fill them in and out compete them. They've serve their purpose. Um, if they really bother you, we'll talk about kind of ways that you can manage them. In this case, it would be physical. So if you really hated them, you could pull out your lawnmower and mow them down. And that would be a perfectly acceptable way to take care of them. Um, but you know, it's, it's a kind of a personal choice. The big question when you are looking at this is, is it harming the plant, the garden or the yard? So is it actually going to cause that plant to die? And then is that plant dying worth the time and energy to combat it, or is it better just to replace it and from an economical and an environmental standpoint? So again, this goes back to the, is it worth spending $20 to save a $4 tomato plant kind of thought. So when it comes to taking action, you always wanna think physical control first, then biological, then chemical. And when you come to chemical, you wanna use the least toxic chemical that's going to actually do the job. It doesn't do you any good to apply chemicals out there if they don't actually treat it, because that can actually be more harmful environmentally than just using something a little bit more powerful that works in one coop. So it's not always the best analogy, but I always tell people like, you know, is it better to stick your hand in normal bleach or is it better to water down a bleach in a bucket of water and have to put your hand in it every single day? 
So both are going to cause a little bit of harm, but which one's going to be least uncomfortable in the long term? So you can kind of think of it that way. So again, once you kind of get done with all of your decisions on whether or not you're going to take an action or not, you want to continue monitoring your garden, and then you want to evaluate whether or not that action worked. So I had dead needle in my turf. I didn't want any weeds. I found them unsightly. So I pulled out my lawnmower and I mowed them all down. And I noticed two weeks later they were back. So I had to mow them again, but for two weeks, I controlled those weeds. And this is where keeping a garden journal comes in really nicely because you can write and record this all down. There's lots of apps that can do this as well. I also recommend garden journals because particularly if you're someone like me, who's always just trying new different varieties of vegetables or growing new cool plants, I'm always losing those tags. And now if you have a you know, garden journal, you have a place to kind of store those or take, I actually now take pictures of them on my smartphone and I have a little um, Google doc where I upload all that to keep track of it, so, okay. So now we're gonna move into kind of talking about these control tactics themselves and how to use them. And just like the old food pyramid, you wanna do very little of what's on the top, which would be chemical and a lot more of what's down here in the bottom. So again, think of it back to your own health. So a lot more of these preventative things and cultural and sanitation things, and then a little bit of the biological and physical. So I've sort of restated this now twice already, but we'll go over it one more time, which is a lot of the prevention and cultural stuff is again, just making sure that those plants are as healthy as they can possibly be. A healthy plant has fewer problems. So that's making sure the soil's good, that they're getting enough fertilizer and that they're getting enough water. And that's not too much water, that's not too little, that's kind of however much they need. So, you know, if we're gonna get a lot of rain in the springtime, don't worry about watering them. Is it summer? Okay, maybe they can go a day or two, but if we have a whole week of, you know, 90, 95 degrees days, you may wanna give them some water. And I'm gonna be, uh, turf grass does okay with a sprinkler, but most other plants would prefer a silker hose. You end up losing a lot of water to evaporation when you use a sprinkler system. It's much more effective to use a silker hose when you have large plants that need water. You also wanna do things like mulching correctly. So this right here is a horrible way to mulch a tree. We call these volcanoes. And not only are you wasting a ton of money because this is definitely like two, maybe three bags of mulch, but all of this mulch right here is an ideal habitat for boring insects. And the moth can lay her eggs, they can bore in and they can live in the tree and then they can come out and pupate here. And then when they emerge, bam, they can just lay their babies right there and repeat the whole cycle. And as that boar is coming in and out, all the fungi that's living in here that wouldn't normally be an issue can get in. And before you know it, this tree will be dead. It might take five to 10 years, but it'll happen. Um, so just be smart and mulch effectively. You only need about one to three inches around trees. And most of the times, you, unless you're going to hit, you know, you have someone who's a little aggressive on a lawnmower, you don't even have to mulch around a lot of your trees. And some other things you can do is if you live in an area that's more inclined for disease issues, is you get resistant varieties. You can buy resistant varieties, particularly of a lot of vegetables. You can also get grafted varieties to deal with that. It might cost you a little bit extra, but you know, if I spend $6 instead of four on a tomato transplant, and that means I don't have to worry about getting downy mildew, that's worth $2 to me. Um, again, you can replace any kind of troubled plants. So again, if you got a tomato plant in the middle of your bed and it's covered in aphids, you might just want to rip it up and go to, you know, box store or check your local garden center to see if they still have any and just replace it. It might just be easier to do that than to struggle with trying to get that insect pest under control. So some other things, proper pruning, um, specifically with kind of vegetables a little bit, but a lot of kind of your perennial stuff, when you prune them, it helps them stimulate growth. It also helps open up the canopy so that, you know, their leaves get more exposure down below and air circulation comes out, which reduces disease issues. For vegetables, you do want to rotate your garden. So you don't always want to put the same vegetables in the same spot every year because that helps lead to disease buildup in your soil. If you are pruning, you always want to clean your pruners, especially if you're pruning anything that's diseased because the bacteria and viruses and everything can live on your pruner. So just 
all those wet wipes um, that we've been using to sanitize our hands, just take a few out with you and just wipe off those blades in between every single cut if you're working with something diseased. Keeping your weeds down is also really beneficial because a lot of those weed plants can harbor pests as well. And then proper kind of garden maintenance and spacing is another big one. So here's your garden when it's first planted and here's it a few years later. And you can see that at the beginning, this looks kind of sparse, but if they had planted these plants super tight and close to each other, they wouldn't have had space to spread out as they got bigger. So when we talk about mechanical and physical controls, um, we're really talking about removing it. So that would be things like hand picking or weeding them where you're either removing the entire pest or just part of it. So if you are, you know, come across to some leaves on one of your trees that maybe have some goals or they've got some leaf spots on them, just grab some pruners and prune them on out. It's okay. Um, likewise, if you do have that bunny, put up a barrier. If you're happy with him chomping on the dandelions and clovers in your front yard, but you want him out of your vegetable garden in the backyard, Put up a barrier and see if that helps to keep him out. Tillage is another great example of this. And then I talked about pruning as well. So you can use biological control. Um, this is a great example of kind of using nature to fight nature. So this would be the use of using predators like this predatory mite, parasitoids. So each one of these little white things is a little wasp. These are the pupae. So when they hatch out, um, they will mate and then they'll go find other caterpillars like this. And this caterpillar is basically dead. It's not gonna reproduce, it's not gonna pupate, it's not gonna become a butterfly, it's, it's life's pretty much over. Or pathogens in the case of these nematodes and this grub to suppress the pest population below damage level. So again, the goal isn't to get rid of them completely, the goal is just to keep them at a minimum so that your plants and your garden stay healthy and then you're happy that the way it looks. So some nice eco-friendly ways to get these guys into your garden um, without having to necessarily pay for them. Cause I know a lot of people will say, okay, well, I bought ladybird beetles or I bought a prey mantis egg case to put out there. And honestly you can do that, but I encourage people to really think about landscape changes rather than buying insects to kind of fight other things. So things like reducing your pesticide use, and then really creating a complex multi-layer habitat. So having trees and bushes and having flowers that bloom spring and then other flowers that bloom in the summer and then others that bloom in the fall is really good. Um, particularly natives tend to be really, really nice because those will bring in our native natural enemies. So things like, again, this parasitic wasp that is laying her egg inside these little caterpillars. So these caterpillars are gonna die and. Then another wasp will be out to get other caterpillars that manage to make it. So um, mulches are another great way to particularly control weeds as well. Okay, so that takes us to our last IPM strategy, um, which is chemical controls. And a lot of people dislike the use of chemicals and they don't want to use chemicals. And there's kind of a place and a time for them. I can say I'm an adamant gardener and I, with the exception of dealing with poison ivy, never use chemicals on my yard. Um, I just don't have to, but there are different people who have, again, different uh, thresholds and have different issues. And sometimes they may or may not. Um, there's a little old lady who lives a few doors down from me and she can't get down on her hands and knees and hand weed her garden. And she paid someone to do it for a long time. And it got to the point where using something like preen now becomes easier for her to handle. So it's a balancing act of all of these together. And if you choose to use chemicals, that's okay. Again, we would ask that you consider using them as a last resort. So try using some of these other techniques. When and if you have to use a chemical, you always want to follow and read the label. Um, normally these labels will be on the containers, but they're super tiny. So we always recommend going online as soon as you buy a chemical, put it into Google, and put label next to it. And it will generally, the website for the company will come up in the first one or two and you can go to their website and they will have a label. It'll be a PDF of that label. You can download it, you can zoom in and you can read all of this amazing, great information about what the active ingredient is, how you're actually supposed to use it, how you're supposed to mix it. When do you apply it? When don't you apply it? Does it need to be applied when there's water? Does there no, no water? Um, can it get applied to seedlings, pre-emergence? Like all that information is in here. 
what kind of safety equipment do you need to wear when you use it? Do I need closed toed shoes? Do I need gloves? What type of gloves? Do I need to have a respirator? All of that information is going to be in this label. It's also gonna give you information about non-target effects. So is this dangerous to bees? Do you need to be cautious of that and not apply it to plants that are actively being pollinated? Is it toxic to fish and other aquatic wildlife so it can't be applied within a hundred feet of water? All of that is gonna be in the label. And a lot of times when people use chemicals and have adverse effects in the environment because of chemicals, it's because they didn't read and follow the label. Um, these labels are made with lots of science kind of going into them. And also a lot of times people aren't using them at the right rate, which means that you may not be getting the right effect because you may have diluted it too much down or you may have overused it and not diluted it, in which case you might burn the plants that you're trying to protect. So again, read the labels. We don't recommend using homemade stuff. Um, you can go onto lots of different blogs and they can say, well, don't use those chemicals you get at the store. Instead, mix up two cups of vinegar with a cup of salt and just spray it on the plants. And while that may work, that may also kill your plants um, because there's not a lot of scientific backing to that stuff. So again, when you're looking for control tactics, stick with, you know, you can definitely check out blogs for inspiration, but I would recommend going to extension websites, university websites, garden organization websites, you know, places that are going to have some sort of experimental trial and error to prove that it's safe for you, it's safe for the environment, it's safe for the garden, and that it's effective. Um, I've had people not so much with home garden, but I had someone call me and say, okay, so I mixed up these three things in my house for ants and it just corroded all of the grout around my like bathtub. What do I do? And I literally had to be like, well, I'd wash it off and go get new grout because it did that. And, you know, these were basic household things. So again, please don't use household stuff. Please actually, you know, go find actual chemicals that have been approved by EPA. And you can definitely find organics. Um, there's tons of organics out there that you can use as well. Okay, so with that, we're gonna kind of go into some springtime issues. So these are pests that you're likely going to encounter sometime in the next month or so. Um, most of these are gonna be April, May, a little bit into June. Um, I would recommend if you are an animate gardener, and again, if you have questions about pests later in the year, you can definitely check the extension website. You can follow our newsletters. We'll definitely have um, some live things where we'll answer questions coming up later in the year, which is why I'm kind of focusing just on these springtime ones. So the first big one that I think is on everyone's mind this year, because it's the first time we've seen it in 17 years, is brood 10 of the periodical cicadas. So these are not to be confused with our annual cicadas that come out every year. These guys have been underground for 17 years and they are coming up and they are hungry and they are horny. So they are going to come up. They're going to do a little bit of feeding on your trees. Then they're going to find a mate and then they're going to reproduce. And then the female is going to come and she's going to lay her eggs. So this is the cicada. Her ovipositor is right here. And what she's doing is jabbing it into about pencil sized twigs on trees. And she just goes up and down a line and just lays her eggs. And what that causes is this, which we call flagging damage. So it's just the browning of all the leaves past it because she's basically ruined the circulatory system of the tree from past that stage. So on a tree this size, this isn't gonna kill this tree. This tree will be perfectly fine, um, but it's not the most prettiest thing. You've got all these dead branches, so you could, either come through on your own and prune these out or hire an arborist or a landscape company to come through and kind of prune all these out and you'd be perfectly fine. Again, it's not gonna kill this tree. Um, if you do have kind of smaller newly planted trees, things that pretty much all of the, the twigs are about a pencil size, we would recommend getting netting like this. It's about one inch netting. And as you can see, these cicadas can hang out on the outside. They can sing their song. They can get eaten by all kinds of wildlife, but they can't really get into your plants. So that's kind of the best compromise is to create, again, that physical barrier. Um, we do not recommend 
treating any trees with chemicals to prevent cicadas. They're, they're such large insects. Um, it's not going to be cost effective and it's not really going to work. And you're probably going to end up killing a lot of non um, target insects, both beneficial and kind of neutral ones. So using the netting is, is really ideal. The other thing you can do is if you were thinking about planting new trees and bushes, just wait until fall. These guys will be gone by August and then you don't want to plant anything in the heat of the summer, but you could plant a whole bunch of trees in, you know, September. And then they have all of September and October and November to kind of get themselves a little established before winter. And that you, that's perfectly fine. You can plant trees in the fall, just as well as in the spring. So the other type of damage that we see, particularly in early spring, is frost or cold damage. So this, again, is a abiotical damage. So this isn't caused by a disease. This isn't caused by a bug or anything. This is 100% environmental. So particularly when you have kind of those tender summer crops, so things like peppers and tomatoes and eggplants, um, and you're already seeing them out in, in the stores. I was at Ace the other day getting broccoli transplants. And they had tomatoes out still, um, which is a bit too early for them, but you know, you can still buy them. You got a cold night and you're gonna get this kind of black cloudiness to the whole branches. It'll eventually turn black and kind of droop and die off. And you can just prune this out. As long as there's still some healthy tissue further in, you're good. If not, your plant's dead. It's, it happens sometimes, you know, go buy some more transplants and you'll be fine. Things like bushes and shrubs, it may be the black brown. You may also get this, which is like a light tanning. It may only be around the edges and not in the center. It might curl a little bit, um, but normally you would see this damage and then the dead giveaway would be if you said, well, you know, what was the weather like last week? We had that night where it got down to the twenties. So maybe that's what caused this damage. So another insect that you're going to likely see coming out, and this again will be more like mid-May, so a little bit later, is going to be the spotted lanternfly. Now, this is an invasive insect from Asia. It's not spread all across Maryland yet, but we've got about three or four counties that have it. So Cecil and Hartford have it. I think Washington has it, or Frederick. Um, we have found adults in most of the counties, but it's whether or not you have active nymphs. So again, just keep an eye out. The egg masses look like there's chewing gum stuck to things. And then you're gonna have these very domino looking black and red um, nymphs that will turn into these very striking adults. But as you can see, they don't like to feed alone. So all of this texture on this tree isn't bark. These are adult spotted lantern flies. And while they aren't going to necessarily kill this well-established tree, it's definitely not good for this tree. Um, so I would recommend if you see one of these, please reach out to Extension, please reach out to MDA. You can go on Penn State because this was an invasive insect that came into Pennsylvania, actually has the best resources on how to go about managing it. So I would recommend if you do find one, go to Penn State for how to manage it. But definitely try to snap a picture or collect one and then send it to either us or MDA. So again, um, so another common, in this case, disease that you're gonna find in the spring is cedar apple rust. And you normally see it affecting cedar in the springtime and then by summer, it'll move to apples and quinces and hearth, hearth thrones. Um, but in the springtime, when it starts getting kind of, we have that moist, humid, um, not chilly, but you're not quite warm yet. You'll see these balls forming on your cedar trees and they'll start off and they'll have these cool orange tenules. And then as it dries up, the tendrils will dry up and then it'll just be this globby brown ball. And I think they're kind of cool, but if you're, they're not your cup of tea, you can just prune these out. Um, when it comes to apple trees, you get these little frog eyed, they're like bright colored rings on it. And again, you've got a whole big apple tree. This isn't going to really kill that apple tree. It's, you know, it's a little stunting here and there um, comparatively. The bigger issue is that this can get on the fruit and then it would make the fruit unedible. So you may need to, if you have cedar trees near your apples, you may need to consider doing a fungicide spray at some point. Um, because again, funguses, and most diseases have to be proactive. There's no antibiotic for plants. So you would need to be pro 
active at that. But for the most part, unless you have an apple tree surrounded by cedars, you should be okay. And then you can see what it looks like on the hawthorn. It's again, that really cool, weird alien look. So, but again, none of this is gonna kill any of these plants. So you will get some insect feeding if you plant it coal crops. Um, so the broccoli that I just planted um, the other day potentially could get things like flea beetle damage as well as some caterpillar damage on it. So the best thing that we can recommend for this would be to go again to that physical control. So you can get things like floating row covers and just put a few stakes up around those plants, droop the floating row cover over them, use some bricks or two by fours to weigh them down, light goes through them, bugs can't get in. Because the nice thing about coal crops is they don't need to be pollinated. You probably want to check on them every few days to make sure that you don't have any fungal diseases or anything growing in there. You may want to open it up for a little bit and then close it again, but it's a great way to kind of control against insect pests is just to exclude them. And then if you do end up having something like caterpillars and cabbage, the nice thing about this is if you harvest it, you can normally shred off those outer leaves and the inside head's normally still good. So it's still edible. Downy mildew is one that we tend to see in late spring. It again is another disease that likes it kind of on the cooler side and a little bit more humid. Um, there's different varieties for different types of plants. So the one that is affecting basils and coal crops is a different variety than the one that is going to affect cucurbits later in the summer. That one happens to like it a little bit warmer. But if you do happen to see this, it's going to be kind of this fuzzy tan gray on the underside of the leaf. And if you flip it over, it's gonna be more yellow on the top. And you can easily just prune these out if you want. So like, here's an example of a leaf that's just pruned out. You can snip these off. If the whole plant's covered in it, that's another example of you might, you know, do a cost benefit balance. How much is this basil worth? Is it worth me trying to fend off downy mildew or is it just as easy for me to go ahead and toss this and go buy a new, basil plant. So tree caterpillars are another thing that kind of pop up in the springtime. Um, and there's two main species that I normally get calls about. And the first one is the gypsy moth, which is this caterpillar here. This is what the adults look like. Um, they come in both a light colored and a dark color variant. You can still go out and hunt for their egg masses and scrape off their egg masses. They tend to hatch end of April, beginning of May. Um, but depending on where you are and how warm it is, that may be sooner or later. But if you see their egg masses, you can scrape these off really easily. Just use like a, um, like a plastic card or a piece of sturdy cardboard and you can scrape them off. If not, you can band your trees as well. So this is a, a band here and you can see one or two caterpillars may have gone past it, but the majority of these guys aren't going to make it off this tree to the leaves to feed. And these guys like to feed in large groups and they can defoliate a, a tree. And especially in early spring when those leaves are still sort of coming in, it's easy for them to do. But the nice thing is that these guys are normally gone by end of spring, beginning of summer. And that tree has enough time to put on new leaves to still get itself through winter. So these guys are not going to kill this tree. If you come across these and you do absolutely nothing, your tree is not going to die. Um, it might be weakened, so you may need to sort of take extra care if you have hot days. You may want to make sure that the following year you band it then so that it doesn't have repeat year after year of dealing with gypsy moths. But a one-year issue is not going to be a big deal. Um, the other caterpillar that you're going to find is the eastern tent caterpillar, which is this guy. Um, and these guys like to live in a group tent. They're commune caterpillars. So you'll find them in, you know, bundles like this. And a really easy thing you can do is just grab a stick or something and rip open this tenting. Um, this tent provides them with a really nice, moist, humid habitat. And they will venture out at night and they'll feed on leaves and then they'll come back and hang out here during the day. But if you rip this open and walk away, birds will come in and eat them. Um, some of them will dry out. Parasitic wasps will get in there. So you'll definitely diminish their numbers as well. So, and again, these guys feeding on your tree isn't going to kill it as long as it's a well-established tree. If it's a brand new tree that was just planted last year, the year before, you may want to be a little bit more careful. But if it's a well-established tree, you really don't have to worry too much about these guys. But I, we kind of always get people who are concerned because this isn't very sightly. It's not really pretty to look at. 
So with that, um, I will take any questions people have. I do want to kind of give um, my email addresses there. So if you guys have any questions, you can definitely shoot me an email. You guys will get a PDF of this uh, presentation along with the link when it's up and follow-up surveys. Um, here's the new URL for our Home and Garden Information Center. It probably won't be up and really running until next week, but you can also put UME HDIC in Google and you'll find it. And then I am going to give a shout out. I am one third of the Garden Time podcast. So if you are a podcast listener who wants to hear about cool garden topics, um, we release a monthly podcast all about them. And we also do live Q&A sessions during the summer. So with that, I will take any questions that we have. Hey, Emily, we had um, two questions come in while you were speaking. So I'm going to go ahead and read those. And for anybody else who has um, any specific questions, um, just take a moment now to enter those into the chat box. Um, okay, so the first one, um, this is from Judith. I lost all my figs and hazelnuts to birds and squirrels last year. I'm planning to use bird netting to protect the plants this year. Is this an effective solution or should I try another approach to protect the fruit and nuts? And then I guess there's a second question related, which is, is reflective tape effective at deterring birds? And so, so yes and no. So reflective tape works to some extent, but birds are smart and they will soon learn that that is not something to be scared of. Um, and then it won't be effective anymore. So you sort of, if you are going to use it, I tend to say like you need to use it when it's super effective and ideal. Um, the netting is really nice and effective because again, it creates kind of a barrier. The one thing to be cautious of is with birds is you want to try to get kind of the smaller netting um, because you don't necessarily want birds getting trapped in it. So I would recommend if you do use bird netting, make sure to go out every day or every other day and just check to make sure that there aren't, aren't any birds that have gotten stuck in the netting itself. Um, Cause the last thing you want to do is go out there and find a, a dead bird. Um, at least I'm one of those people that, would hate to go out and do that. Um, a barrier as well, squirrels are a bit tricky because no matter what you do, they're smart enough animals, they'll kind of find a way around. So you can definitely try um, the netting for them as well. And if they end up chewing through it, then just <laughs> nope that you got duped again by the squirrels and try something else next year. Um, you may also try putting something like a bird feeder on the opposite end of your property. So if you have your hazelnuts and figs and say your backyard, maybe put a bird feeder up in the front yard and see if like you just providing them with like a stable diet someplace else can deter them away from those, especially if you do it with the netting um, and see if they like that instead. But yeah, I would say that bird netting is probably an effective way to, to go about that. Um, so I believe with both of those are plants that need to be pollinated. So you would either want to wait and put the netting up after they've been pollinated or make sure that the netting is big enough for your pollinators to get through it as well. And then uh, I know people have used reflective tape on blueberries and it was hit and miss. So again, try it. Um, you know what the worst that happens is you lose all your figs and your hazelnuts again, but you know that they went to a good cause, which is the animals. So I will say for bur or for blueberries, um, yeah, the most effective method I know is using bird netting, you know, just um, helps keep um, birds. Uh, I've never had a problem with squirrels. But yeah, it, it's very effective at keeping birds out as long as you put it up um, correctly. Okay, we've got another question. Um, I have a large elm tree that has several areas from which... Um, uh, weeps sticky sap. What causes this? I have a sense that this is killing it. So if there's sort of holes that you're seeing like the sap coming out of, there's a few things that could be causing it. So you could potentially have something like um, honey sap suckers or woodpeckers that are drilling into the holes going after kind of insects that are in the trees and then the sap's coming out of it that way. Um, you may also have boring insects that try to get into it. So things like um, longhorn beetles or metallic wood boring beetles 
potentially could have. And again, they would have drilled kind of a hole in there. So I would check where it's weeping the sap and check to see if you see like a small hole there. And then from there, that's the kind of thing you could take a picture of and send to the ask extension. And someone can hopefully help you figure out what's causing that. Um, there are some trees that sort of naturally release sap, particularly if it's been a really like wet spring and they have too much water in them. They kind of, uh, I hate to say they pop or they burst because that's not really quite accurate, but they kind of leak a little. But to my knowledge, elm trees aren't one of those. Those tend to be more of the hardwoods. So I would, I would check and see if you either have bugs in the trees or birds pecking at the trees that could be causing it. Um, and unfortunately, if it's got wood boring beetles in it, you can do a lot of the preventive stuff to keep the tree as healthy. But if it's had wood boring beetles in it and it's a few years past when they've done their damage, chances are the tree is going to deteriorate. Um, just because you, those beetles will eat that thin layer where their xylem and phloem is, which will eventually kind of kill them. Okay. Um, looks like that's all the questions we have. Um, Emily, anything else you want to add? No, just thanks for coming, guys. Um, I hope you guys enjoyed this talk and any of the other backyard farming ones. Um, and we look forward to doing some other talks either later this year or next year for you guys. Yeah. All right. Enjoy the rest of your evening, everybody.